Hello, and welcome to the start of the video. Today we're going to be talking about everything, or more specifically, what it's made of. Particles. It's commonly understood that there are two types of particles in the universe, fermions and bosons. No matter if you have an electron or a photon or any other kind of on, they all fall into one of these two categories. But why? And how come there are only two? Well, in this video, we're going to discover the beautiful topological secret behind these two types of particles. It's probably not what you think. And we're also going to discover that fermions and bosons are actually not the only two players in the game. We're going to start by discussing the wave function of quantum mechanics, because that's going to be needed for our discussion. If you already know what a wave function is, feel free to skip to this timestamp here. Next, we're going to define fermions and bosons, not using quantum mechanical spin, which you might have heard of before, but thinking about what happens when we exchange two particles. And then things get really interesting. We're going to find a different way of doing quantum mechanics using something called configuration space. And we'll see that the topology of this space holds all of the answers to our questions. Finally, we'll see how everything changes in two dimensions. To properly talk about this topic, we need to use complex numbers. But if you're not familiar with complex numbers, don't worry, I hope this video will still be accessible. Although I definitely suggest checking out one of the many brilliant introductions on YouTube. For our purposes, the basic fact you need is that complex numbers are two-dimensional. They exist in a plane. So they have a magnitude, a distance from the origin, and a direction. Okay, so let's get into quantum mechanics. The goal of quantum mechanics is to describe and predict the state of a system. Maybe we want to know the position of a particle. If you were in the business of creating a science for how tiny particles moved, you might build an apparatus to measure one's position. You measure it at some initial time, then wait a minute and look again. But in the intervening time, the particle might have moved in some seemingly random way. Inaccessible to you because your apparatus measures where the particle is, not the direction in which it's moving. But after a while, you might figure out that there is a pattern to this motion. Maybe the particle is more likely to turn up here than here in the second measurement. So you think, maybe the best way of characterizing the system is by using probabilities. You can't know everything about the system, but you can know the probability of finding a particle somewhere were you to make a measurement. This is what the wave function of quantum mechanics tells us measurement probabilities. Let's see how. The wave function is just a fancy mathematical machine which takes in some spatial coordinates, the position of a particle, and spits out a complex number. For example, if our particle can only move in one dimension, its position can be described by a single number, x, which is fed into the wave function. So how does this output of the wave function give us measurement probabilities? Well, probabilities are always greater than zero. So what if we took something about this complex output that satisfied that property? Maybe the distance of the number from the origin, d. That's certainly always greater than zero. It turns out we actually need this distance squared, but that's not too important. So for a possible location, I look at the value of the wave function at that point, take the length d of the output and square it, and that tells me the probability of finding the particle there. If I do this for a bunch of different positions, we can build up a probability density function describing the location of the particle. Where it's peaked, we're likely to find the particle, and where it's zero, we can never find the particle. While we ultimately care about these probabilities, we still need this wave function if we want to describe certain things like interference. Now, this introduction is definitely not adequate for a proper comprehensive understanding of the subject, but hopefully it gives a bit of understanding as to why the tools of quantum mechanics are the way they are. Now have a think about this. What happens if I rotate the complex output of my wave function through some angle? This doesn't change the distance of the number from the origin. So rotating the output by any angle doesn't change the measurement probabilities. It's just like if I only care about a number squared, it doesn't matter if the original number is positive or negative. In fact, a real number being multiplied by minus one corresponds to a 180 degree rotation of the number in the complex plane. It turns out that performing a rotation through any angle can also be done by multiplying the output by some complex number. For our discussion, you don't actually need to know what exactly that number is. The take home is that multiplying the wave function by this number just rotates the output in the complex plane, which doesn't change that all important distance from the origin, and hence doesn't change the probability density function. By the way, this distance is called the modulus of the complex number and indicated with bars around the number like this. So the complex version of our squared number observation is that if two complex numbers have the same modulus squared, then they are related by some rotation. 
Let's now suppose we have two particles, one with position x and another with position y. The wave function describing the full system is then a function that takes in two sets of coordinates, x and y, and spits out a single complex number. We write this fact as psi of x comma y equals z. So now this wave function is encoding the probability of finding one particle at x and the other particle at y. Now this is the crucial step. We are going to assume that these two particles are indistinguishable. There is nothing you could do to identify one or the other. They're like twins that you're guaranteed to get confused. Let's call one of these twin particles, um, I don't know, Fred, and maybe the other one will be called George. So now, because they are utterly indistinguishable, the probability of finding Fred at X and George at Y has to be exactly the same as the probability of finding Fred at Y and George at X. Now the question is, if I have two sets of coordinates, one representing Fred at X, George at Y, and the other representing Fred at Y, George at X, what should happen if I feed both of these sets into my wave function? We know that the outputs have to give the same probabilities, but does that mean the outputs themselves are the same? No, not at all. Remember, if the moduli of two complex numbers are the same, then the numbers themselves are related to one another by some rotation in the complex plane. So the wave function output for Fred at X and George at Y has to be just a rotated version of the output for George at X and Fred at Y. Okay, so now we're ready to define fermions and bosons. If that rotation angle is equal to zero, so the two output numbers are the same, the particles are bosons. And if it's equal to 180 degrees, so the outputs are negatives of each other, we call the particles fermions. Just as a small aside, let's see one of the consequences of this minus sign for fermions. What would happen if I tried to put two identical fermions in the same location? If I swap their locations, the wave function picks up a minus sign as usual. But swapping them doesn't change their positions, both particles are still at position x. That means the wave function is zero when the particles are both at the same location. Here, we've just witnessed the famous Pauli exclusion principle for fermions. No two identical fermions can occupy the same location, since the wave function at that point is zero. The Pauli exclusion principle is responsible for the structure of atoms and basically all of chemistry, so this minus sign can have some pretty important physical consequences. Okay, but back to the main story. I just told you there were only two possibilities, right? Fermions and bosons. But this is pretty mysterious. It seems like there should be a continuum of possibilities. Swapping the inputs could rotate the output by any angle. So why are there only two types of particle? To explain this, we're going to need a better way of describing this quantum system of two particles. And in doing so, we're going to discover what topology has to do with all of this. We've been thinking of our wave function as mapping from a pair of vectors, representing the two positions of our particles, to a complex number. But is this the most natural way of thinking about the input space? To keep things simple, let's suppose our particles live in 1D, with positions x and y. We can package these numbers into a 2D vector with components x and y like so. Each point in this space represents some arrangement that the system could be in, like one particle at position 1 and the other at minus 2. But we're actually overcounting the possible arrangements in this space. Remember, swapping the positions of the two particles doesn't change anything. So these two points here represent identical configurations of the system. In fact, any point reflected through this line here will result in another point representing the same configuration. That means if we want a space where every point represents a distinct state of the system, we should consider only half of this plane. This is much nicer. Now we have a space in which each point represents a unique configuration for the system. Doing this, we don't need to specify that our particles are indistinguishable. The fact is baked into the space of configurations, which, by the way, is called the configuration space. How do we imagine the configuration space of higher dimensional systems? Well, let's jump over the 2D case for now and go straight to particles moving in three dimensions. We can't picture the entirety of this configuration space because it has a whopping six dimensions, but we can picture the important slices of the space. Let's suppose that our particles have a fixed center of mass. We'll also suppose the particles are a fixed distance apart. Notice that we can still exchange them in this setup. So what are the possible configurations? Well, because the particles are a fixed distance apart, we can think about them as being confined to lie on opposite points of a sphere. Take a moment to think about what the configuration space for these two particles on a sphere would look like. 
Remember, we want each point in the space to represent a unique configuration of the system. Maybe we could split the sphere in half and label the configuration by the location of the particle in one of the hemispheres. So now each point in this half sphere here represents a distinct configuration that the system could be in. A particle here on one side and the partner particle here on the other side. This is all fine and dandy, but the tricky thing is thinking about what happens along this boundary here. Well, as one particle moves out of this hemisphere, its partner moves onto the hemisphere through the opposite point on the boundary. And then the configuration is labelled by the position of this particle. So these two opposite points should be glued together in the configuration space. We should consider them to be actually the same point. And in fact, any two opposite points along the boundary are similarly identified. Not gonna lie, this is a pretty confusing concept. So just take a moment to pause and have a think about this space. Okay, firstly, topologically, nothing changes if I squash this half sphere into a flat disc. That's a bit easier to visualize. But we still have this bizarre feature that opposite points along the boundary are glued together. How do you go about figuring anything out about this space? It's worth playing around with this object a bit, particularly if you've never seen it before. If you're struggling to think of where to start, maybe just take a pencil and start doodling on the space. You might consider the different paths you could draw through this space. Here's one here. And here's another. And maybe you notice, hey, I can draw a path that goes off one direction and comes back from the opposite direction to end where it started. But what have we drawn here? Remember, this path represents a trajectory that the particles can take. Specifically, the trajectory that exchanges the two particles. This is what particle exchange looks like in our configuration space. But this path has a kind of weird feature. Imagine the path were a piece of string. Imagine it could be squished or stretched in any way, so long as you didn't cut it or change its start and end points. If we look at a simpler path that doesn't involve an exchange of the particles, the string can be pulled in until the path is shrunk to just a point. But we can't do that with this exchange path. There's something about this space that means as you pull the string in, it gets stuck on the space itself. Now let's try a slightly more complicated path. Let's see what happens if we draw a path that goes around the space twice. Can we shrink this path at all? Give it a try. Remember, the only thing you can't move is the start and end point. And there you go. We found that if you go around the space once, the path can't be shrunk to a point. But if you go around the space twice, it can. In terms of our particle picture, one path is equivalent to a single exchange and the other path to a double exchange. What does all this mean for the wave function? Well, to each point along one of these paths, the wave function assigns a complex number. You might think that as you follow one of these paths around the space and back to where you started, the wave function should also go back to where it started. But this path here is an exchange path. It starts at fred at x, george at y, and ends at george at x, fred at y, or something like that. So if we assume that the wave function has to return to where it started, we're assuming the particles are bosons. In fact, our wave function has to be multi-valued to properly account for different types of particles. This point in the configuration space is mapped to multiple outputs that are all related to one another by some rotations. So as we proceed along one of these closed loops in configuration space, the wave function returns to its original value except for that possible rotation. For our purposes, we can assume that this rotation doesn't depend on the details of the loop along which we move. If I smoothly deform the path, the rotation angle doesn't change. Now, in three dimensions, if I follow this exchange path twice, the result is a path that can be deformed down into a tiny loop and eventually to a point. That is, a path along which the particles are not exchanged. There's no rotation that occurs along this trivial path here, and so there can't be any rotation that occurs along this double exchange path. So if going around the space once results in this rotated wave function, going around the space again rotates that number back to its original value. So whatever rotation gets picked up after a single exchange, that number needs to square to one. There are only two square roots of one, so we get two possibilities, plus or minus one. Two types of particles, bosons and fermions. This is to me mind blowing. Just by thinking about this configuration space, we can determine what kinds of particles exist in the universe. By the way, what we've been talking about here is actually a branch of topology called homotopy. 
If two paths through a space with the same start and end points can be smoothly deformed into each other, they are considered equivalent or homotopic. Specifying all inequivalent paths through a space can tell you something important about that space. For example, any closed path you draw on a disk can be shrunk to a point. But if we puncture the disk, all of a sudden some of these paths are no longer trivial. The punctured disk has an infinite number of inequivalent paths. Meanwhile, the configuration space we saw for two particles in 3D has only two inequivalent paths. Finally, we get to the elusive two-dimensional case. We can get a good understanding of 2D configuration space by drawing space-time diagrams. Let's stretch our paths into a third dimension so that we're visualizing the entire history of our particles. So this is what an exchange path would look like. Now, what happens if I move these particles along a double exchange path? Unlike in three dimensions, this path can't be deformed into the trivial path. Remember, you can't change the positions of the start and end points in configuration space, so the top and bottom of these strands are fixed. So two exchanges is not the same as zero exchanges. Just like for the punctured disk, this configuration space has an infinite number of inequivalent closed paths. And the wave function can be rotated by any angle, since a theta no longer has to square to 1. In two dimensions, you don't just have fermions and bosons, you have particles that can be anywhere in between. For that reason, we call them anions. This crazy realisation was only made in 1977, in this beautiful paper which I would highly recommend reading. The discovery was expanded on by Frank Wilczek about five years later, and it was initially thought that this phenomenon was just a mathematical quirk of quantum theory. But in fact, by the time Wilczek had published his paper, physicists had already discovered real 2D systems that they would later realise exhibited anions. The system was displaying what's called the fractional quantum Hall effect. Anions now form a crucial part of our understanding of 2D systems, and may even be useful for quantum computation in the future. But that's the subject for another video. The take-home message is that it's sometimes worth digging up these esoteric quirks in our theories of physics. Often the universe has a funny way of rewarding our hard work. So thank you very much for watching. Um, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see some more topological physics-y things in the future, or just physics-y things in the future, um, well I'm sure you know what to do.